this summer we had given an activity named tracing roots to the school students in which uh, students uh, had to speak to their parents and their grandparents to find out how and when and under what circumstances their families settled in kolkata so several interesting migration stories uh, emerged as a result of this activity so today we shall have glimpses of some of these stories it is an honor for me to present my tracing roots project to everyone here this evening for this project i had interviewed my paternal grandfather whom i call dadu my paternal grandmother tham and my mother and father when i spoke to my mother and father they even told me about their childhood interests while my father was an avid lover of cricket my mother spent all her growing years appreciating nature all around her they even told me many unknown stories and precious memories of their time in guwahati my mother showed me a very special earring which was passed down to her by her great grandmother our family delicacy is spicy dry fish in assam is known as tukan fish and in bengal it is also known as shukki mach we have it every new year so um Sirshi, it was delightful to hear you talk about uh, your family from Guwahati, and for talking about uh, the uh, food, the the special foods that have been that that uh, come from Guwahati, which your family has been um, cooking, and uh, the various other uh, details, including those lovely earrings, which you seem to have inherited from your great grandmother. Good evening, everyone. I am Arachika, and I have a story to share with you about my grandfather. Let's start with the map starts. Thank God. My grandfather's family was one of the respected families in Burma and had a flourishing business in Tharawadi. They got on quite well with the local community. During the interview, my grandfather spoke about the mezzanine floor in the home in Tharawadi. which i found very interesting as a child my grandfather had a limited number of games to play so they played a golf like game with sticks and stones and also played a game called chaila with a light game ball doesn't it feel terrible to leave your home well this is my grandfather turned 18 his whole family had to leave burma as the military had taken over and lost all their property they moved to hugli after I was very interested to hear that your grand grandfather had to migrate from uh, Yangon, uh, Rangoon, as we used to call it, yes, and Burma, which we used to call it Burma. Now it's called Myanmar. Uh, it, of course, immediately raises questions in my mind as to what were the circumstances in which they had to move. It would be very interesting to talk to your grandfather about it. So. maybe at some stage you will sit down with your grandfather or your parents and find out from them how was the migration process how did they what were the difficulties they had when they migrated for this project i interviewed my paternal grandfather my maternal grandmother and my parents my grandfather whom i fondly call dada lives in the house which is more than 160 years old and is one of the oldest houses of bagwajal the lane adjacent to it and all the houses around it belong to us once upon a time the floors of some of the rooms were built as early as the late 19th century so it's very interesting upaman you that you've taken all this pains to understand the history of your own family and the traditions that, that are followed in your own family and where they come from and this is what gives us a sense of heritage this is what allows us to understand 
why, why heritage is important and why we need to understand and preserve heritage. So this is a book I have written. It's a book not just on Bombay and Calcutta or, or Mumbai or on Kolkata, but on pretty much all of India uh, on all that we know about migration in the past. And I'll start with this most powerful symbol of migration, which is on the train. So when we talk about migration, you know, I heard wonderful presentation saying, my father came from here, my mother came from here, my grandfather, my grandmother came from here. But it's also interesting to know how they came. And I'll start with the whole idea of how people move in the first place. Right? It's, it's obvious to think now, oh, if I have to go to Calcutta, I'll take a flight or I'll take a train. But for many years, actually, it was very difficult to move. You could not just pack your bags and you know, go anywhere you wanted. So this is an interesting image that you're seeing on your screen, which is, it's called Modes of Traveling in India. And this came out in a London uh, magazine in the 19th century, which shows you different ways, you know, people on the dock, uh, uh, on the palki, people on the bullock cart, horse carts, on an elephant, you know, or just simply walking or crawling on, along the ground. And you'll see that the last image is the railway train. Right? And the railway train is the most important way, even today for both Calcutta and Bombay, in which migrants actually come to the city. So that increased the whole speed of migration into our cities. And that's how the city's population started to grow tremendously. From it. So by the time you reach 1901 or 1911, Calcutta is India's largest city with about a 1 million people or 10 lakh people. And Bombay is actually smaller than Calcutta back there. Now, I'm sure you all have heard about different types of migration. There is internal and international I heard a presentation, a person had gone abroad for studies that is international versus moving within India. Even within internal migration, there is the migration from the village to the city versus the migration from city to the city. You'll be surprised to know that Bombay and Calcutta are similar because more people come to these cities from villages than other cities. But if you go to Bangalore, believe it or not, more people come to Bangalore from other cities rather than villages. So there is much more rural to urban migration in Calcutta and Bombay than rural to urban migration, which happens to say Bangalore or Madras or Chennai today, or for that matter, Hyderabad. So you'll see that most people who move to Calcutta come from West Bengal, not surprising because it's closer, closer. But you'll see that a lot of people come from Bihar and that one red district you'll see is the district called Saran, where so many people come to Calcutta. You know, Bombay, and what I'm trying to point out is that 100 years back, both cities absorbed people from everywhere. But today, Calcutta absorbs people from its immediate hinterland, whereas Bombay continues to absorb people from various parts of India. And you'll see again from Uttar Pradesh, which is a state out here, a lot of people are moving to Bombay. From Gujarat, where I'm based, a lot of people are moving to Bombay. So uh, I want to talk about what happens to the city of Calcutta after the partition of 1947. So I've read uh, Chinmay Tumbe's book, uh, India Moving, and I, al I also really liked uh, thinking about the partition of British India as a trifecta. Uh, so I am talking about the second and the third partitions. So 1947 and then the Bangladesh uh, Liberation War, that is 1971. Calcutta is a migrant city. It is a city of travelers. It is a city set up only th about 330 years ago as a result of colonialism. It is a city of labor, of transit. And in the 20th century, with the partition, it becomes a city of refuge. We consider the train station to be a spot where we transit from. So we get on the train, we get off from the train. But with the refugee crisis from 47 onwards, often in bursts, the station, the platform, became the place where people found shelter. Eventually, camps were set up in different parts of Calcutta and the outskirts, while uh, some people... Uh, this is a photo of refugee camps and colonies in Calcutta Metropolitan District. So eventually, camps were set up in different parts of Calcutta and the outskirts, while some people also uh, landed up in gigantic houses belonging to... Uh, rich people, which were empty. One of my friends, her family, her grandparents and her parents, when they came over, they used to live in this mansion. This mansion is called Bedi Bhavan. So here you see uh, uh, the marble staircases. 
and you see these really uh, the people uh, devolina and her grandfather who are who are refugees grandfather was a refugee not devolina she was born here who were staying in vedibhav similarly this is a book called the jay walkers guide to calcutta so you have this fantastic marble lion and you have this staircase but you also have extremely poor people who are living in this mansion called vedibhav this mansion was the people continued to live through different waves of migration till the 1990s when they were forcibly evacuated by the then government and then they uh, the place is now some sort of a car park uh, some fancy building etc so what uh, this last person who is a promoter in the area he is telling us how kazipada slowly becomes chittoranjan and south park so you have new colonies being built but you also have new colonies being built on uh, the disposition of a certain other group of people today what we see is a further change of hands now the southern parts of calcutta are the most lucrative places to settle down in real estate is booming and often you have other people people from my side of the city which is not trying in fact buying to settle in calcutta uh, in south calcutta because that is the up and coming place so the history of uh, the refugee struggle that made that part of the city is often less important now than the future of that place the really high stake uh, real estate gamble that goes on <laughs>